The Fist by Marsha Epic Harris. The divorce mediator appointment was at 4 o'clock p.m. in a squat brick office building right off of 56th and Georgetown Road. Asia and Sandra got there first, but Jack wasn't far behind. He pulled into the lot, his stomach lurching at the sight of Asia and Sandra's car. It'll all be over soon, he whispered to his reflection in the rearview mirror. He wasn't an unattractive man. Sure, wrinkles surrounded his blue eyes, but he still had all his hair, and the gray wasn't totally noticeable. He was fit for a man of 52, and generally easygoing. But of course, Asia and Sandra had to make things difficult. Better face the music, he thought. Inside the office, a plump secretary with yellow and brown striped hair sat at the front desk. I'm here for the mediator appointment, Jack said. The secretary's lips formed a hard smile. Asia came to stand next to Jack. Hey, Jack, she said, regret in her tone. Asia, he said. You need to put a deposit on the sessions, the secretary insisted. Jack took out his wallet. A deposit, he asked. It usually takes more than one session, she said. Jack handed her his credit card. Thanks for paying, Asia said. Jack didn't look at her, but brandished his signature on the receipt. The secretary retrieved the paper, handling it as if it were disease. It will be just a few minutes, the secretary said, waving toward the waiting room. Jack nodded and looked at Asia out of the corner of his eye. She looked sad, and his heart tugged toward her, wishing he could reach out and ask her to make up. But after twenty-four years, he simply couldn't take it anymore. When she moved out, and Jack no longer had to argue with Sandra, it was as if the wet blanket he'd been living under for so long had been lifted and he could breathe again. He missed his wife, but Sandra? Not at all. Asia had become a ventriloquist when she was six years old. She drew two eyes and a mouth on the thumb end of her closed fist. Wiggling her thumb, it looked like the folds of her fingers were lips, speaking, and she used a funny voice to provide the fist with words. Want to hear a joke? the fist would say. Yes, Asia would respond. What did the cow say when her friend lied to her? the fist asked. What? That's a bunch of bull, the fist said. Asia and the fist cackled at their own cleverness. Asia's parents laughed at her jokes, too. They encouraged Asia to try producing the fist's voice without moving her lips so she could make the effect even more amusing. Asia practiced in front of the mirror every day. She quickly learned that it was impossible to make the sounds B, F, M, P, Q, V, and W without moving her lips. Undeterred, she figured out how to substitute sounds that worked. She practiced obsessively. Indulging in her fantasy, Asia's mom started asking strange things like, Does the fist want eggs for breakfast? Asia replied in fist's voice, No, chocolate cake! Then Asia would correct her and say, Eggs are healthier, Sandra. It took a while for her parents to start calling Asia's fist Sandra, her given name. But once they did, Sandra became a truly integrated part of the family. In fact, Sandra became Asia's best friend. Asia didn't have any siblings, and her parents worked an awful lot, so Asia shared her life with Sandra. They told each other their secrets. Sandra confessed the horrors of having one's face washed off daily. Asia promised to tattoo Sandra's face on her hand as soon as she turned 18. Asia told Sandra that Eddie Johnson pulled her pants down on the playground. Sandra nodded with a flat-mouthed grimace. I saw that, Sandra said. Next time, we karate chop him. But mostly, Asia confessed to Sandra that she didn't understand why her parents were always around, but never there. 
They were realtors who worked from home, but when the office door was shut, and it was always shut, Asia was left to her own devices. Do you think they even know I'm here? Asia asked Sandra. Don't worry, Asia, Sandra would say. I'll always take care of you. Jack didn't want to explain their problems to a third party, but Asia had insisted. It's embarrassing, Jack said on the phone. Asia cleared her throat. Are you saying that my relationship with Sandra is abnormal? Yes, I am, he said, and I think a professional is going to simply say that you have a split personality. I can hear you, you know, Asia replied, using Sandra's voice. Oh, fuck off, Jack said. I'm talking to Asia. She's not here, Sandra replied. She went to the toilet. You're attached to her body, he cried, his hands clenched in anger. Then, looking at his own fists, he shook his hands open, trying to get the sight out of his head. He thought about the early days when he accepted Sandra as just part of Asia's personality. At first, Sandra sort of turned him on. She was dirtier than Asia and liked getting kinky with him. Asia's bedroom behavior was often decorous, but when Sandra was in charge, she enjoyed doing things to Jack that he didn't even know he would like. A couple of years after they got married, they had two children, Tara and Mickey. When the kids were little, they thought it was hilarious that their mom's best friend was a hand puppet. They tried to mimic her and were mildly successful. But after the kids got in school and their friends would come over to play, everything changed. The other kids were scared of Sandra and didn't understand where her scruffy voice came from. Mickey would try to explain that Asia could speak without moving her lips, but to other kids, it wasn't funny. It didn't help that Sandra was so insulting. Once, a little girl came to play with Tara and broke Tara's favorite doll. Sandra said to the girl, You're never going to have nice things. You're going to grow up and have sex with rich money for men, like your mom. Today? Jack thought once as he and Asia were escorted to a small wood-paneled office. I'm just going to have some common decency. But for the love of God, couldn't you wear a glove? They sat on the opposite sides of the table and waited. Jack had to admit, Asia looked stunning. She had her hair cut recently, and her bangs swept effortlessly away from her gorgeous brown eyes. Her body and clothes was seemingly perfect, but he knew the real Asia. The faded stretch marks from the kids, how her breasts sagged when she wasn't wearing a bra. Her imperfections were badges of their experiences together. His eyes traced the contour of her shoulder, remembering her wedding gown with the lace that formed the neckline, the elbow-length gloves she had worn. That was the one peaceful day without Sandra. His eyes traveled down her arm to the hated fist, resting placidly on the large, faux leather chair. Two eyes, long ago tattooed on Asia's hand, seemed to narrow and glower at Jack as the red painted lips grimaced. The thumb on the fist dropped to spit out. What? Nothing, Jack said. Sandra, please, Asia said. You're in control, you know. Jack said. How many times have we been through this? Jack shrugged, the familiar disgust throbbing in his temples. He couldn't bear the dissonance of the two women in Asia's body. She was a permanent prisoner to herself. The door thrust open, and in came a grandmotherly woman with a notepad, wearing a pantsuit and helmet hair. Her glasses sat low on her nose, and her smile looked like an apology. You must be Jack and Asia. Nice to meet you, she said, holding out her hand to Jack. I'm Stella Stafford. I'll be mediating for you today. Jack shook her hand. Asia nodded but kept her hands on the chair. So, Stella said, we need to figure out the assets. Since your children are in college, there's no custody, but we do have to figure out who is paying tuition. I want to acknowledge that not everything gets worked out in one meeting. So I've heard, Jack said. I don't think it will take long, Asia said. 
Have you already agreed to arrangements? Stella asked, confused. We have, Jack said, gesturing to at himself in Asia. It's Sandra that won't agree. And who is Sandra? Stella asked in a neutral tone. Me, Asia said in Sandra's voice, holding up her fist. My name is Sandra Bobandra, and I'm the third party in this relationship. Oh, Stella blinked. Then, an impartial smile returned to her face. She looked back and forth between Asia and Jack. She's the reason we can't be together anymore, Asia said. Sandra and Jack can't get along, and it's caused problems. Stella removed her glasses. I see. Jack leaned back in his chair. How many times have I heard her explain this? The only question was whether Stella would be one of those idiots who just accepted Asia's peculiarity, or, like the kids who had been terrified, ran away. It's her hand, all right, Jack said bitterly. She thinks it's a real person, and it's not. It's her hand. Stella nodded and looked back and forth between them. Sandra is not just a hand, Jack, you know that, Asia said. He's never accepted me. Sandra said. I'm too blunt for him. Well, this is a unique case, Stella said, writing on her notepad. How kind of you, Sandra said, as if Stella's awkward response were a compliment. Jack rolled his eyes. Why aren't actual fucking adults ever on my side? So, what have you discussed as terms of the divorce? Stella asked. We'll sell the house and split the proceeds, Jack said. Neither of us need such a big place anymore. I want the house, Sandra said. There are memories there. I don't know why she's doing this, Asia said. Memories, Jack laughed. My memories are of the house, Jack, Sandra said. I don't want to remember you. No one could ever forget that pimple of a dick you have. Jack smirked. So typical, Sandra. Stella nodded with a concerned coo and wrote more notes. So, Sandra is a person, Stella said in a voice full of empowerment. She smiled pointedly at Asia's fist. Not really, Jack said. It's just, when you live under these conditions for so long, you just sort of give up. Asia stroked her Sandra hand. She is real, Asia said, and his penis is fine for the record. You like fucking me more, Sandra said. Asia shrugged. We just communicate better than Jack and I do. It's masturbating, Jack said. When you're fucking Sandra, you're just masturbating. Stella kept writing, then paused to say agreeably to Jack, I can see why you'd think that. It's like I can read her mind, Sandra said. Rage tore through Jack. He should have hospitalized her years ago. He'd been weak. The only time he'd ever suggested getting help, she had a complete breakdown, staying in bed for days and threatening to cut her hand off. It scared him. But now he felt the kind of fatigue that sets in with bone-chilling clarity. He wished he'd let her cut the damn thing off. Come on, Jack, Sandra said. You liked watching us. Oh, please, he retorted. Asia looked like she was going to cry. Jack, Asia said. I love Sandra. Is that what you're going to tell people? That you're gay for your hand? You know that's not what I mean, Asia said. Sandra's been there for me since I was a kid. When my parents got divorced... She was there. When my mom got cancer and died, she was there. When I was in labor for 34 hours with Mickey, she was there. She's always known exactly how I felt and what I needed. She's been there a lot more than you. How could I have possibly been there for you more than a part of your own body? Let's try to be respectful, Stella said. Yeah, Jack, Sandra said. How about a little respect? 
Jack stood and paced the length of the small room, his heart racing. Respect, said Jack, as if this insulting digit bitch has any respect for me. She's sitting there looking at me like I'm the problem, Jack said. I can understand your frustration, Stella said, but Sandra is part of this discussion, so please try to be decent to her. Are you serious? Jack asked. Stella shifted in her chair, a look of detached calm on her face. You can't tell me that you're going to let Sandra be a part of the divorce proceedings, Jack said. You see that she's crazy, don't you? I can see that Asia and Sandra have special needs, Stella said. Clearly, Jack said. He flopped into his chair. He was tired of fighting with adults who were too embarrassed by Age's proclivities to address them. He had been one of them for a long time, justifying Sandra as an eccentricity rather than a symbol of Asia's deep-seated abandonment issues. But Asia had never even tried to address those problems, and the deeper her feelings of loss, the darker Sandra became. When the kids left for college, both majoring in abnormal psych, Sandra took over. Asia took a piece of paper out of her handbag and slid it over to Stella. Here are the terms that we'd like to actualize going forward, Sandra said. I think they are very fair. Stella looked at the memo. Have you seen this, Jack? She asked. I have, Jack said. And what are your objections? Stella asked. She wants to split our assets three ways, Jack said. And what is the problem with that, in your opinion? Stella asked. Jack stared at Stella for a moment. Seriously, he asked. Stella didn't respond. Okay, let me put this in kindergarten terms. Asia and Sandra are counting themselves as two people, and I'm only one. So they get two-thirds, and I get one-third. It does seem unprecedented, Stella nodded. I'm pretty sure that isn't legal, Jack said. Oh, you'd be surprised, Sandra said. Shh, Asia scolded. I'm just saying, Sandra said. Look. Jack went on. No court of law is going to declare Sandra an autonomous human being that deserves a third of our assets. Do you want to go to court? Stella asked. Jack slumped and shook his head. No, he said. I don't want to, you know. What? Stella asked. Embarrass her, he said. She'll become a freak show. You act like I can't hear you. Sandra said, and Jack ignored her. And I don't want my business to know that I'm married to a crazy per... <sighs> Mentally challenged, Stella interrupted. Jack sighed. Things could get messy. Maybe more for me than for her. It seems like everyone I meet gives Asia a thousand feet of cuckoo space, and I'm looked at like the loser who can't accept my wife's special talent. Asia started weeping into a handkerchief that Sandra suddenly offered her. You try living with this, Jack said. There's the beautiful side of Asia, the one who ate peanut butter sandwiches when we were broke, the mother of my children. And then there's this part of her that is ugly, abusive, demoralizing, and won't shut up or go away no matter how good things are, no matter how much money we have or how hard I try. Sandra can't stop judging me and controlling us. I'm done. I'd rather be on my own and mourn the person I thought I married than have to deal with the daily inadequacies that Sandra will never let go of. Jack looked at the table and tried hard not to let the welling emotions take over. He thought about the wall of framed pictures in their living room, Asia's smile shining out from each family photo grouped together in photogenic triangles. The bodies in those frames looked like any other American family. Strained lips, bearing teeth, eyes forked at the edges, opposed attempts at fooling the world. Nice speech, asshole, Sandra said. Now let's sign some paperwork. Jack snarled. Not as long as you think of yourself as a person. That's just it, 
Asia said, wiping her eyes. You've never accepted me for who I am. Who in the hell would? Jack shouted. Maybe the people who don't... <clears throat> Maybe the people who don't have to live with a parlor trick, but you can't see how unreasonable you've been with me. I guess that's why we're getting divorced, Sandra said. I'm not married to you. Stella cleared her throat. Please, let's come back to the issue at hand, Stella said. Christ, Jack sighed. Someone save me from this stupidity. Stella looked over the paper with the figures on it again. You are asking for a lot, she said to Asia. And he's right. No court would have supported it. Some mediator you are, Sandra said. Asia followed with, Now, let's not get personal, Sandra. Stella looked at Jack. See what I mean? He said. Jack, you don't understand her, Sandra said. She is not well. You think you can take care of her? You don't even know her. The pain she's carried around. You can't even begin to understand it. And now, you, divorce. Every single person in the world has left Asia, but me. And I'm not going to let you hurt Asia ever again. The fist reached into Asia's purse and pulled out a gun. Stella pushed back from the table, squealing in fear. Jack froze in his seat. He looked hard at Asia. You are in control, Asia, he said slowly. Don't let her do this. Shut up, Jack, Sandra said. You have no idea who's in control. Stella looked at the gun in the fist and uttered in hysterics, You're holding a gun! How are you even talking? Sandra replied, Asia's not the only ventriloquist in the room. Stella yipped and held her hands over her mouth. Sandra, put the gun down, Jack said. You don't want Asia to go to prison. You're supposed to protect her. From people like you, and you're the reason it's come to this. Jack leaned forward and whispered, Asia, please, don't you dare, the woman screamed at him, her mouth opening wide. My name is Sandra. Jack lunged across the table, scrambling for the gun. Sandra pulled the trigger and bang rattled the room. The kickback from the gun surprised the fist and caught her off guard. Jack knocked Sandra and Asia to the ground, hot pain screaming through his side. They struggled, rolling over, and the gun was knocked away. Locked face to face on the ground, Jack struggled to grab at her arms, but his hands were slick with blood. The woman rolled him to his back and pressed her thumbs to his neck as hard as she could. Jack grabbed his wife's wrists, trying to stop the intense pressure on his throat. Garbled choking sounds filled his ears. Panicking, he released her wrists and smacked at Asia's face, kicking her feet, a mad dance on the ground. Her unbelievable strength, strength he never knew she possessed, was squeezing the life out of him. His vision started swimming. Just as suddenly as it started, Asia stopped. She fell limp, letting go of Jack and rolling away from his body. She stared at him as Jack coughed and gasped. His neck felt bruised and swollen. He rolled to his knees, his forehead on the floor. Tears fell easily as he huddled there, his hands shielding his head. He sobbed and tried hard to breathe, his chest heaving. I'm calling the police, Stella yelped, running from the room. Don't move. Asia lay looking at him. Bluish circles had appeared under his red bloodshot eyes. I'm sorry, she whispered. I don't know what came over her. Jack crawled across the floor to the gun, grasping it in his hand. Jack, I'm so sorry, Asia pleaded. He came to her side and pinned the fist to the ground, the gun in the middle of Asia's upturned palm. You're hurting me, Asia said. Don't. Jack looked at Asia, her face wincing with pain. A ghastly hole punched through the fist as Jack pulled the trigger. Asia screamed, but did not try to remove her hand from his grasp. Jack pulled the trigger again and again and again. Asia's hand was shredded with wounds. Jack rolled away from Asia. She held her ruined hand to her chest. He gulped the air, filled with the smell of gunfire. 
Are you okay? He asked, looking at her across the stained carpet. She shook her head, her face wet with tears. You killed her, she whispered. You killed her. The door swung open, and the first responders filled the room, shouting questions and talking into radios. An EMT got in Jack's face. Sir, have you been shot? he asked. Jack's eyes swam again. He felt down the length of his torso to his wet, blood-soaked shirt and felt the hole in his side. Sandra did it, he said, gingerly touching where the bullet had torn into him. Who's Sandra? the EMT asked. He pointed behind him. Is that Sandra? Jack shook his head, trying not to give in to the darkness that was starting to overwhelm him. Gone, he said. Gone. His head fell to the side, and he saw Asia wearing a white bridal gown with elbow-length gloves. She smiled at him and gestured for him to follow. She walked through a grassy meadow, turning back to make sure he was coming. He stared at her gloved hand swaying at her side until the darkness pulled him under. Marsha Epic Harris teaches Shakespeare and Dramatic Literature at Marion University. Her most recent fiction publications appear in the Bookends Review, Down in the Dirt Magazine, and Mused. Follow her on Twitter at Epic Harris and check out her complete publications list at www.mepicharris.com The music in this episode is by Sealand. You can find more of their work, including their album